a 15-year-old girl hiding as terrorists were all around her, hoping that she would stay alive. On May the 5th, 2024, in churches across America, Eagles Wings partnered with the Moral Hearts Alliance in what we called Solidarity Sunday. Solidarity Sunday brought over survivors of the October 7th massacre so that we could bear witness to the atrocities that were committed by Hamas against innocent Israeli civilians on October the 7th. Interestingly, uh, providentially, uh, May the 5th coincided with Holocaust Remembrance Day. The nations of the earth for 75 years have been putting out the slogan, never again, but certainly never again is now. We see an alarming rise of anti-Semitism that we have not seen since the days of Hitler's rise to power. I want to invite you to hear the testimony of these survivors of the October 7th massacre on Solidarity Sunday as we bear witness and we commit ourselves not only to the slogan of never again, but to living lifestyles as watchmen on the wall to commit to the safety of the Jewish people and of the state of Israel. Oshrit is a leader at Kibbutz Nachal Oz. Oshrit can give historical context of how this violence escalated. On October 7th, she was in contact with many of the families as all of this unfolded. She tells the stories of those who were murdered. She tells the story of a 15-year-old girl hiding as terrorists were all around her, and she was texting Oshrit throughout the day, hoping that she would stay alive. Oshrit reads the text detailing her fear, the fear for herself and her brother, who is in another part of the kibbutz. Hear with me now and bear witness to Oshrit as she tells the story of October the 7th. So October 7th, 6.30 a.m., huge bombardment. We hear explosions, very, very loud explosions. And we are used to that. I mean, Israel has had its share of rockets and mortar bombs and all that kind of things. And in our kibbutz, due to the proximity, of course, we've had our share. Something was different that day, okay? I mean, when Hamas wants to fool around, he will launch rockets to the fields, to the surroundings of the kibbutz. Uh, a kibbutz, if you don't know, it's like a small village, a very small village. And, um, and this day, the, the explosions were very close to us. I mean, they were aiming at the neighborhoods, right at our houses. 6.32, uh, I think, the house right um, behind me got hit by a rocket. Of course, my husband and I, my husband and I ran to the safe room. In Nachalos, um, in every house, one of the rooms is a bomb shelter, okay? Because we don't have much time to take shelter. We have four to six seconds. Uh, so each, each house has a bomb shelter. Most of the families let the children stay there. So my husband and I ran to the bomb shelter. Our children were already there. After a while, I started accepting messages, text messages to my phone from people around the kibbutz. I'm an educator. Okay, I work with the children and, teenager of my kib and teenagers of my kibbutz. But I started getting SMS messages, text messages from, from t uh, teenagers. And I uh, realized that something really bad was happening. They told me that they hear shooting all around their houses. And, they're asked me if, and they asked me if I know what's going on. I was so naive at the moment. I told them, well, it must be the IDF, you know? I mean, who could believe that the IDF was not there? About an hour later, around quarter to eight, I think, 
we started getting um, messages about our, the head of our regional council. He's a, he was a dear friend of mine. And uh, we heard that he, he was murdered. That really opened the day for us, okay? That was the start of understanding that this one is on a completely different scale. There was one teenager who started texting me and um, the texting between her and, and me was throughout the day. It started quarter to seven, we finished at 11 p.m. That teenager was with her mother and her younger brother in their uh, home and um, there was very, very serious fighting around the, the house and terrorists kept uh, trying to get in. And they were very nervous. The, um, at a certain point, the mother um, almost fainted and the teenager was so sourceful uh, that she contacted me and she told me, listen, we're out of electricity. The, we don't have electricity. We, the Wi-Fi comes and goes. Many families were without electricity, without Wi-Fi, without being able to connect to the world outside their uh, safe room. And uh, she tells me, listen, I don't get the messages from the kibbutz security because they send it to the mother. And the mother's phone is already dead. They don't know how to, uh, they can't charge it. And uh, she said to me, okay, you need to tell me everything that's going on. So we started, you know, uh, talking between ourselves. And um, her fear and her panic at certain stages were something that I will never forget in my entire life. She's uh, practically begging for help. She, she writes that, um, that um, she hears Arabic around her house, she hears uh, gunshots, she hears uh, people trying to break in, and she doesn't know what to do. Now, her brother, her older brother, is um, about to join the army. And in the kibbutz, in that age, you get a unit of yourself. You don't live with the family. So her brother was in another place at the kibbutz. And she told me that they can't get hold of him. So we really started fig trying to figure out what to do, you know, how to, how to reach him and how to make sure that he's fine. Now, I'm still locked in my, in my safe room. There's really not much that I can do except from sending her messages to, you know, other people to handle it, the army or whoever can, uh, can help. Every time she tells me that we need to come really quickly, I send the messages, but nobody's answering. I mean, they tell me, okay, but nobody gets there. It took me, um, it took us really 24, 30 hours to understand that there were so many messages like that coming from all around the kibbutz that the people that were supposed to protect us didn't know where to go first. Uh. The attack was unbelievable. They uh, sought to, to you know, eliminate entire families, and they have. Um, in my kibbutz, uh, throughout that day, we've lost uh, a few teenagers. We've lost uh, whole families that were, you know, slaughtered. Uh, we have one teenager that was left without anyone in the world. 
and uh, it took us time to understand what was going on. We tried to be in our safe room as quiet as possible, and uh, hours just went by. Now, I have uh, two children. My son is disabled. So unlike most of the families of the kibbutz, uh, who found creative ways, you know, if they needed to go to the toilet or things like that, I couldn't. I mean, my son cannot go to the toilet in the safe room. So we had to open the door a few times and, you know, take him out and, and bringing him back to the safe room. Those were really, really moments of terror, seriously. Firstly, because it took a few attempts Okay, the, the, the attack was so massive that we couldn't find a, a time to take him. You know, we, we said, okay, he's not gonna walk with his walker because if he needs to turn around and run back to the safe room, it will take him too long. So we must uh, each, you know, take him from one side and take him there. And we really had to plan, you know, every, every time he had to go to the toilet. The city of Sderot, which is 10 minutes drive from me, okay, away from the border. And we see uh, videos from Sderot of pickup trucks, you know, with Hamas fighters standing on them, with machine guns and, you know, they're... Um, and um, all around the city of Sderot, in the police station, between houses and all that, and we held our head and we're going, oh my God, if this is going in Sderot, which is 10 minutes drive from here, what on earth is happening just outside my house? Hamas, who had uh, GoPro cameras, okay, they filmed the whole thing. Um, filmed two families from my kibbutz, People that live three blocks from me. The family sitting on the floor, people wounded, people killed. And everything was shot, you know, everything was filmed live, streamed to the internet, to Facebook. And we see our friends, our neighbors, on social media, whole families with guns and machine guns and RPG rockets aimed to them. And um, I can't explain to you really what I felt at that moment. I said to myself, okay, okay, dear Lord, if this is the day, this is the day. And I held my head there, I'm saying, my neighbors three blocks away from me being held like that, captive by, you know, Hamas terrorists, you can see the horror in their eyes. And I'm saying, what, what am I doing here? It was hours and hours that we couldn't leave our room. We had to stay silent. And I must tell you something really, really amazing. You know the book of Exodus that they say that when the Jews fled Egypt, you know that there's a debt, there's a, uh, the, the Jewish people have a debt to dogs for all eternities. Because they say in the Bible that when the Jews fled Egypt, dogs didn't bark. Okay? Now you think to yourself, okay, maybe that's a story, but I've lived that story, because October 7th, when we were supposed to be silent in our homes, not one dog barked at the kibbutz. <laughs> that was something really, really amazing. And um, so we sat there, we were waiting for the IDF to come, and we hear the stories of what's going on. Suddenly, I hear someone messing with my door. Oh my God. 
I looked out of the safe room and this person saw me from the window and he shouts to me, IDF, IDF, open the door. I'm saying, I don't know you. You can wear a shirt. I don't know you, I'm not opening the door. And I want to go inside the safe room and lock it. And he's shouting, no, listen, I'm Jewish. Today is Simchat Torah. We were supposed to do a kafot in the evening. And he starts telling me, you know, the Jewish tradition. So I will believe that he's Jewish. And I said to him, okay, you know what? If you're Jewish, recite this prayer. Recite that prayer. And he starts reciting the prayers that I asked him to recite. And only after that, I opened the door. Now... I hugged that soldier, you know, in my wedding, my husband, I didn't hug him like that. I mean, I fell on his neck, seriously. Now, my son who's disabled could not walk out of the safe room and he was terrified. So we had to take all that squad of soldiers to go into the bedroom, into the bomb shelter, to show him that, you know, everything is okay, it's IDF soldiers. Now, we thought that it's, you know, it's the end of it. But they had to continue fighting. So they left us there, just making sure that we're okay. And uh, we, stayed, we stayed like that for long, long, long hours. Um, we got the message around nine saying, uh, IDF soldiers will come to your houses. Do not leave the bomb shelter uh, unless the IDF arrives. Each family will get out of the shelter and will pack its bags only when the soldiers are there and you will be taken with them out, escorted by them. So you can understand that it takes a long, long time, yeah? They reached my house at 2 a.m. Uh, which was a blessing, okay? When I sat in my house waiting, I was going like, okay, what's, you know, you're eager to get out of there. But end of the day, it was a true, true blessing. Because all the surroundings of the kibbutz, all the roads, all the houses, all the paths were filled with dead bodies. And my children didn't see any of it because it was 2 a.m. So thank God for that. Really thank you, Lord, for that. And uh, we were taken with, you know, special army vehicles, each one of us, each one of the families. And I remember really uh, being worried about my neighbors. I mean, we, we all texted between ourselves, yes? Uh, uh, make sure they take me, make sure they take me, make sure no one forgets me. So we made an, uh, an alliance between us saying, whoever gets the IDF comes, you, we make sure that they take this and this and this, okay? All the neighbors. <sighs> it took the IDF until about 6 a.m., 24 hours later, to evacuate the entire kibbutz. We found out the day after that um, five people from my kibbutz were kidnapped, an eight-year-old child, girl, a 15-year-old girl, an 84-year-old grandma, um, and two men in their 40s were still held in Gaza. One of them is a dear, dear friend of mine. The other one is a dear member of our community. When I saw his picture here on the, on this pins, I really, I started crying. I got so emotional. And we must remember that when we are sitting here, going back to our safe homes, there are 130 people sitting in a dark tunnel, waiting to be saved for so long, for so long. 
And we need to bring them home now. Now. We arrived to Kibbutz Mishmar Emek, which is up north, at 6.30 in the morning, my family, exactly 24 hours after it happened. It took us a few de days, you know, to count our dead. 14 people in the kibbutz were murdered, including entire families. And we live in a very, very small regional council, okay? So the kibbutz next to me and the other kibbutz next to me, we had friends there, we had families. I had, I'm a teacher in the local high school. I had students, students who were burnt alive with their families. I have students who were raped and mutilated and kidnapped. We need you. We need your support. We need you to stand with us against evil. Because the Jewish people have always lived in the Middle East. It is a complete lie to say that they haven't. And having been originated in the Middle East, I think to myself that there must be a peaceful place in the Middle East for me to live in. And even when being limited to the tiny, tiny Israel, I can't have that. Because there are no Jews in the Middle East anymore, just in Israel. Huge congregations of hundreds of thousands of people from Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Libya, Morocco, Tunisia, you know. They're all gone. Check me. Iran had hundreds of thousands of people. They have like four Jews left. That is the real genocide. That is the real genocide. This is biblical gaslighting. We need your support. We need all the people that believe that evil, that darkness must not rule, need to stand with Israel firmly and fiercely against terror, saying this is not allowed. This is not okay. And that's my story. And I really want to thank you for being here. You really, really made me feel amazing here today. When I saw you, when I saw your devotion and, your, and the fact that you came here, thank you so much. Thank you. I know that this testimony has touched your heart. It has filled you with a fresh perspective that can only come from hearing from the heart, the mind, the story of those who have endured this atrocity. Eagle's Wings is committed to staying on the front lines of this battle. Sadly, October the 7th did not start on October the 7th. This battle for the existence of the state of Israel goes all the way back even before the founding of the state in May of 1948. There has been, within the hearts of radicalized Islam, a violence against the Jewish people that knows no bounds. I want to invite you to click the link and go to our front lines page, and you will see firsthand what Eagle's Wings is doing day by day on the front lines in Israel. We are there through our Abraham's Bread feeding centers, through our United Hatzalah outreach, through our Forest of Life program, which is working with disadvantaged youth who are uh, being sheltered right now in the middle of the hills of Judea. You want to get involved with this effort. Go right now to the Frontlines page and let me know that you're standing with us as we make a difference for Israel and the Jewish people. And if you haven't yet done so, click on the links and listen to the stories of the other survivors that brought forth this powerful testimony on Solidarity Sunday. <laughs>